Good morning, dear students. My name is Farhan Mazal, and today is 23rd of April 2021. And right now we are studying the subject of uh, physics. Uh, this is all our physics. The code is 5054. Today we have set our hearts to solve uh, October, November 2020, 505422 paper. This theory paper belongs from the zone two. Today in this session, we are going to solve the section A of this paper. Section B of this paper, I will solve in another session and I will make a video and upload in my YouTube channel. So let's start um, today's paper. And here on your screen, we have the first question. So this is uh, October, November 2020, 2-2. The time allowed is one hour, 45 minutes. Section A, question number one on your screen. A glass beaker has a mass uh, of 50 gram, a liquid of density 1.8 gram per centimeter cube is poured into the beaker until it reaches the 200 centimeter cube mark. Calculate the total mass of the beaker and its contents. The mass of the beaker, we know that's 50 gram. The mass of the contents, we don't know. Uh, the density of that liquid is given, that's 1.8 gram per centimeter cube. And the volume of that uh, liquid is also given, that's 200 centimeter cube. So I can very easily find out the, the mass of that liquid. Um, the formula will be density multiply volume. So once you know the volume of the liquid, you know the volume of the beaker, just add them. That will be the total mass of the beaker and its contents. I've done this on a paper. Let me show you my work. So here we go. So the total mass of the, of the beaker and the contents will be M1 plus M2. M1 is the mass of the beaker only. That's 50 gram. M2 is the mass of the liquid. I will find out that mass. That is the density multiplied volume. That's the formula. The density is 1.8 and the volume is 200 centimeter cube. So 50 gram plus 360 and that the mass will be 410 gram. The mass will be 410 gram. So let's have a look at the marking scheme. What the marking scheme has to say. So the marking scheme says that the question number one, uh, 410 gram or 0 0.41 kg will be the final answer. So our answer is right. So let's go to the next part. Here he says the center of the mass of a meter rule is at 50 centimeter mark. What is meant by the center of mass? Center of mass is the point in the body where you can support that body. Or you can say the center of the mass of the body is where all the mass appears to be concentrated. So I've written this answer. Let me show you my answer and then we can go. So the place where the mass appears to be concentrated, the place where the mass appears to be concentrated, that point is known as the center of the mass. So let's check the marking scheme. The marking scheme says a uh, place region where the mass appears to be concentrated or where the object balances. That's what this is question number one, uh, B first part. So let's move to the next question. Here we have. The meter rule is placed on a pivot. The tip of the pivot is under the 80 centimeter mark on the rule. The beaker with its contents is then placed at different positions along the rule until the rule is balanced. Figure 1.1 shows the arrangement with the rule balanced. So here we have the pivot. The pivot is at 80, centi mark, at this 80 centimeter mark. Here is the center of mass. So the weight of the ruler will be acting here. It's at 50 centimeter mark. So the moment arm is 30 centimeter, 80 minus 50. You can see this is 30 centimeter. So the moment arm is 30 centimeter. Here you have placed the beaker. The center of the beaker, the center of the mass of the beaker will be uh, this uh, side is at 84 centimeter. This side is 92 centimeter. So the middle point will be at 92 plus 84 equals to divided by two equals to 
and that will be 88 centimeter. If you add 92 and 84 and then divide it with two, that will be 88, 88 centimeter. So it will be at the center of the mass of the beaker will be at 88 centimeter. The pivot is at 80 centimeter. So the moment arm of this beaker from the pivot will be eight centimeter, 88 centimeter minus 80 centimeter. And that will be eight centimeter. Because this whole thing is balanced, let me read the question for you. One side of the beaker is at 84 centimeter mark and the other side is at the 92 centimeter mark. Calculate the mass of the rule. So I can calculate uh, the because this thing is balanced. So the moment produced by this weight of the rule and that is uh, clockwise and that will be equals to the moment per produced by the mass or weight of this beaker and that will be anti-clockwise. The clockwise moment and the anti-clockwise moment they both are equal to each other. So what we will do, we will uh, do this calculation. We will apply the principle of the moments. The principle of the moments is, uh, is very simple. Uh, clockwise moment will be equal to the anti-clockwise moment. And then I can find out. So the clockwise moment is W1 D1 equals to W2 into D2. M1 G multiplied D1, M2 G multiplied D2. G and G will be cancelled. So M1 will be equals to M2 multiplied D2 divided by D1. So M, uh, M2, that's 410 gram. And D2 is uh, 8 centimeter. And uh, D1 is 30 centimeters. So you do this calculation. This is 109.33 gram. If you round it to two significant figures, it will be 110 gram. So this is uh, question number one. Let me check the marking scheme. What the marking scheme has to say. Okay, so question number uh, 10B, second part, you can see the final answer is 110 grams. So our answer is right. Okay, so let's move to the next question. That's question number two. So here we have... Uh, uh, the total mass of a wheelbarrow and its load is 90 kg. A worker pushes the wheelbarrow and load up a plank of length 2 meter onto a platform as shown in the figure 2.1. The platform is at a height of 0 0.60 meter above the ground. The worker exerts, you see, uh, this plank, the length of the plank on which he is uh, trying to push that wheelbarrow is 2 meter long. And the force applied by the, 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 the worker is 290 Newton. And the vertical uh, height gained by the wheelbarrow and its load at the end will be 0 0.60 meter. The first question is, uh, it's a two mark question. The worker exerts a force of 290 Newton on the wheelbarrow in the direction in which the wheelbarrow moves. The gravitational field strength G is equals to 10 Newton per kg. Calculate the gravitational potential energy gained by the wheelbarrow and its load. The gravitational potential energy gained by the wheelbarrow will be equal to mgh. Mgh, where m is the mass, that's uh, the, the mass is 90 kg. G stands for the gravitational field stress, that's 10 Newton per kg. And the vertical height gained by the wheelbarrow and its load is 0 0.60 uh, Newton. So if you will uh, apply this formula, I have done this already on the paper. And let me show you that. So here we got uh, question number uh, two, first part, the potential energy is equals to mgh. So m is 90, new, uh, 90 kg, g is 10, and the h value is 0 0.60. So you simply multiply them, that will be 540 joules. So let's check the marking scheme if our answer is right. 540 joules is our answer. So you can see question number 2A, first part, 540 joules. So our answer is right. So let's move to the next part. The next question is the second part, question number 2A, second part. He says, the worker pushes the wheelbarrow two meter along the plank, calculate the work done on the wheelbarrow by the worker. So because we know the force applied by the worker, if you look at the diagram here in this diagram, the, the force which the worker applied, which was parallel to the, the, to the plank, that is 290 Newton. So if I know this force and I know the distance traveled in the direction of the force, 
I can calculate the work done by the worker. So the work done by the worker will be force multiplied by, by the distance. So that will be 290 Newton multiplied two meter and you will get the work done. I've done this on a paper. Let me show you my work. And here we go. This is the question number. Uh, question number two, a second part work done is equal to force multiplied distance. 290 Newton multiplied two meter, that will be 580 joules. So the work done by the worker is 580 joules. And let's move to the next part. Let's check the marking scheme first. So 580 joules, question number two, a second part. So our answer is right. So let's move to the next part. The next part is uh, question number uh, Question number one, question number two, a second, uh, a third part suggests one reason why the answer to question number two, uh, question number answer to a second part is not equals to the answer to a first part. So the actual work done, uh, the gain in the potential energy uh, was 540 joules, but the work done by the work, the, the worker was 580 joules. So why there is a difference uh, in the work done by the worker? and the gain in the gravitational potential energy. The reason is that uh, uh, there is friction between the axle and the tire. There is friction between the tire and the surface of the plant. So when you have overcome those frictions, so your energy has converted into thermal energy and it has gone into the surrounding, which is a wastage of energy. So due to the, due to, when you overcome the uh, friction, so the, your energy has been wasted. So that's why the gain in the potential energy is, is, is only 540 joules, but the work done by the worker is 580 joules. So the 40 joule energy has been wasted to overcome the friction. So whenever you answer, whenever you answer this question, never only say friction, you have to mention you are talking about the friction uh, between which two parts. For example, the friction between the tire and the surface of the plank, or between, uh, or you can say the friction in the axle and the tire. So uh, never only say friction. So let's check the marking scheme. What the marking scheme has to say, first of all, let's see what I have written. I have also written this answer. Uh, there is friction between tire and the plank surface. Energy has been wasted to overcome the friction because the energy will convert into heat when you will overcome the friction. So that will be wasted. So let's check the marking scheme, what the marking scheme has to say. Uh, question number two, eighth, third part. And it says the friction between wheel and the axle or the friction between the tire, wheel, and the plank or work done against friction. Okay, so let's move to the next part. He says, workers find that walking on the plank, pushing the wheelbarrow is even more inefficient than the answers in the A suggest. What is, the, what is meant by efficiency? Efficiency is the ratio of the useful output energy uh, divided by the total input energy. It's the ratio between the useful output energy to the total input energy. I've written this answer. Let me show you my answer. And then you will be, okay. So the efficiency is the ratio of the useful output energy to the total input energy. So let's check what the marking scheme says about this part. It says the useful output energy divided by the total input energy multiply 100. You can multiply it with 100, then the efficiency will be in the form of percentage and or useful power output divided by the total input power out, power input multiply 100. You can write this formula in both uh, shapes. You can write it in the form of energy or you can write it in the form of power. So don't forget that these two formula, very important formula. Many times it has been asked in the paper. So uh, let's move to the next part. And the next part, in part is, he says, suggest any, uh, so that's one reason why this method of lifting the load onto the platform is so inefficient. You see in this, uh, this method of taking the load to a, a height of 0 0.60 meter, you have to uh, lift the wheelbarrow also. You have to lift the wheelbarrow from the ground to the 0 0.60 meter height. So by taking the wheelbarrow up to that height is a useless thing. And you also have to lift the worker also to that height. So both these works are making this process inefficient. 
So let's me let let me show you my answer. I have written this answer as well. Uh, so here we go. So in this method, wheelbarrow has to be lifted to a vertical height of 0.60 meter, which is making it inefficient. So let's check what the marking scheme has to say. The marking scheme says that uh, wheelbarrow workers, wheelbarrow and the workers has to be lifted up, ignore reference to friction or air, air resistance. Here you, you're not supposed to uh, talk about the friction, okay? Friction has been already mentioned in a previous part. So uh, I think that was the question number two. Hopefully you have understood this. Let's move to the next part. Next question. This is question number three now. So uh, figure 3.1 shows a hot water tank that contains two electric heaters, X and Y. You can see this here. Uh, the cold water is entering into the, into the tank. We have two heaters. One is X and one is Y. They are... Uh, placed at different levels. The X is at a higher level and the Y heater is at a lower level. Heater uh, X is used during the daytime, but heater Y is only used at the night when the electricity is cheaper. The tank is full of cold water and X is switched on. The temperature of all the water above the X increases very quickly, but the temperature of the water below X increases much more slowly. Okay, so the question is explain the process that causes the water above X to increase in the temperature. You see when the, when this uh, heater X will be on. So when the heater X will be on, the water which is uh, above the X and it's in contact with the X, it will absorb the thermal energy. In the mole water molecules, their kinetic energy will increase. The water molecules will move away from each other. So the water here will become hot and it will become less dense. So this less dense water will rise upward and the cold and the dense water from the top will sink downward. So by this, the convection currents will be established in the water and by the convection currents, the heat will be distributed uniformly above the point X, above the heater X. So this process is called convection. So this is a three mark question. You can see here, it's a three mark question and you have to write this process. I have also, I have also written this process. Let me show you my answer. And then we will see it's a three mark question, very important and frequently asked in the paper where you have to describe that how the convection currents will uniformly distribute the heat in a liquid or in a gas. Water above X absorbs heat. Water molecules move away from each other. Water becomes less dense, less dense water rises upward. Cold and dense water sinks. Convection currents will set in. By convection currents, heat will be distributed in the water above the X. Here, when I said that the, and the water moves away from each other, water becomes less dense and hot. You can add a word hot here. The water becomes less dense and hot. Less dense and hot water rises upward. You can write like this. So let me check the marking scheme, what the marking scheme has to say. So question number three, A part, first portion. Uh, water molecule expands as it is heated or molecules move apart. One mark for this. Density of heated water decreases or heated water rises. One mark for this. It rises and the cold water falls or convection currents established. One mark for this. So these are three marks and I hope we have written all the points. It's a three mark question. So let's go back at the question. The second part is the heater wire remains, the heater wire remains switched off. Explain why the temperature of the heater below the heater X, explain why the temperature of the water below the heater X increases much more slowly than the temperature of the water above the heater X. Okay. So uh, it's a two mark question. Let me show you the diagram and explain it from there. So when the, sweet, uh, when the heater X is on, this is off. So here we have the cold water. So the heater, the, uh, the water which is above the point X in it through the convection currents, the heat is distributed. So the water above the X will become hot very quickly. 
the water which is below the uh, heater x here the convection currents cannot be established because the hot because the heater only creates uh, convection currents in the upper direction so the water which is below the x here the heat can be only distributed with the help of conduction but the problem is that the water is a bad conductor so the water which is below the heater x that will take a very long time to get uh, heated because the downward the heat will only come by the process of conduction and water is a bad conductor so let me show you my answer i have written this answer and let me show you how i have written the answer and then we will see so above the above x heat is transferred by convection below x heat is transferred by conduction water is a bad conductor of heat that's why the heat is not coming downward because to, below the x the heat has to come by the process of conduction it cannot come below uh, down the uh, uh, the water which is below the x the heat cannot come by the convection currents because the convection currents don't bring the heat downward they take the heat upward only so bad uh, water is a bad conductor so that's why the heat cannot come downward so the water which is below the x will be heated uh, it will take very long time so let's check the marking scheme and we will see so water below x heated by conduction or no convection occurs so one mark for this thing water is a poor conductor the reason the main reason is water is a very poor conductor so that's why the heat cannot come downward okay so uh, yeah so now we have the question number 2 uh, and it's b uh, b part and it says that uh, this is question number 3 b part the hot water the hot water tank is covered in a thick layer of insulating material the material is plastic that contains a large number of small pockets of the trapped air explain why this material is good insulator this material is good insulator the reason is that the plastic itself is a is is a insulator it does not have free electrons in it so it will not do that much conduction because it does not have the free electrons so there will be no chances of the very good conduction so the heat loss by the conduction will be reduced because the plastic is an insulator and it does not have free electrons in it another very good thing is that the plastic has trapped uh, air in it and when the air is trapped Uh, it will not help in uh, the heat loss by the convection because the air is trapped inside the pockets so the uh, the heat loss by the convection will be also stopped so that's why the plastic will be acting like a good insulator okay so let me show you i have written this answer that is question number 3 and it says uh, trapped air will prevent convection air is bad conductor so it will reduce heat loss by conduction plastic has no free electrons and this also reduces heat loss by the conduction so free electron diffusion cannot take place in the plastic so let me show you the marking scheme what the marking scheme says about this pass uh, this part air plastic is a poor or slow thermal conductor trapping the air prevents convection in air or no free electrons in the plastic so this is a two mark question hopefully you understand the marking scheme and you will be able to write a good answer Okay, so let's move to the next question. That is question number four. Okay, so the question number four is showing up on your screen. It says uh, it's a three mark question. A part described in terms of molecule the structure of a solid. A very very famous frequently asked question, where you have to write the molecule the in terms of molecule the structure of a solid. You see, in the solid, the molecules are in fixed positions. the molecules are arranged on a lattice the molecules are arranged quite tightly and they are placed quite tightly and the molecules are placed in, on a lattice in a regular pattern so this is how you describe such three mark question i have written this answer let me show you uh, my answer and then we will see okay so this is question number 4 a part the molecules of solids remain in fixed positions they are arranged in fixed and regular patterns molecules are tightly packed molecules are on a lattice with 
repeating pattern or repeating arrangement. So it's a three mark question. Hopefully you have understood this. Let's check what the marking scheme has to say. The marking scheme says question number four, A part, molecules in fixed places, positions, arrangements, pattern, one mark for this. Molecules in the lattice or in an orderly repeating regular arrangement, one mark for this argument and molecules close together or tightly packed. One mark for this. It's a three mark question and you now have seen the marking scheme. I hope you can write a good answer which can secure you full marks. Okay, so uh, let's move to the question number uh, four. Uh, now we have this question number uh, four B part. Figure 4.1 shows a metal worker heating a horseshoe to a high temperature before shaping it. The, where we have a horseshoe which is inside the furnace and its temperature is very high. It's so the metal worker. The metal worker then cools the horseshoe by dropping it into eight kg of water at 18 degrees centigrade. The final temperature of the water is 43 degrees centigrade. The heat, the specific heat capacity of water is 4200 joules per kg per degree centigrade. Calculate the thermal energy transfer to the water as, as the horseshoes cool. So, you know, here what, we, what is happening that he will take out the horseshoe. It will be at a very high temperature. He has water, a bucket of water with him. And what he will do, the, the temperature of the uh, bucket, uh, the water in the bucket is 18 degrees centigrade. So he will dip that hot, hot, hot horseshoe into that water. And the temperature of the water will obviously rise because this horseshoe is very hot. So the temperature of the water in the bucket will rise from 18 degrees centigrade to 43 degrees centigrade. So, you know, uh, the temperature, the mass of the water is 8 kg in that bucket. So the, he wants us to find out how much energy uh, is used uh, from the horseshoe to the water to raise the temperature. Whenever there is a change in the temperature, the heat can be calculated. The formula is very simple and very famous. Heat is equals to mc delta theta. Whenever a change in the temperature is involved, heat is equals to mc delta theta. So let me show you my work. I've done this numerical uh, here. This is a uh, two mark numerical. Now it's showing fully on your screen. Calculate the thermal energy transfer to the water as the horseshoe cools. So I've done this numerical. So, uh, so on your screen, you can see that the uh, question number four B first part, heat is equal to MC delta theta. The mass is eight kg. The seed specific heat capacity is 4,200. And the change in temperature of the water is 43 minus 18, that's 25. And you just multiply them, the final answer will be 8.4 X per five joules. So that much heat it has been given from the horseshoe to the water. So let's check the marking scheme if our answer is right, and then we will move on. So question number four B, first part, the final answer is 8.4 X per five joules. So our answer is perfect. Okay, so now let's move to the next part. He says uh, the heat capacity, the heat capacity of the horseshoe is 850 joules per degree centigrade. Calculate the temperature of the horseshoe immediately before it is dropped into the water. You see the horseshoe is in the water and the final temperature of the water is 43. It means the final temperature of the horseshoe is also 43. Uh, the, before you dip the horseshoe into the water, its temperature was higher. I don't know how much. That's what we have to calculate. And the heat capacity, it's not the specific heat capacity, so don't confuse it with the specific heat capacity. The heat, heat capacity of the horseshoe is given, that's 850 joules per, per degree centigrade. And you can uh, find out the change in the temperature. You know the, the, the amount of heat involved, uh, the heat capacity formula is heat divided by the change in temperature. The formula for the heat capacity is uh, ch and the, change, uh, the heat divided by the change in the temperature. So I can, uh, I can show you my work. It's a three mark numerical and very important. You see, normally we don't get numericals on the heat capacity. Normally we use specific heat capacity. So don't forget this part. 
question number 4b second part change in temperature uh, the i don't know what was the initial temperature of the horseshoe that's t minus the final temperature is 43 that we know heat capacity is equals to heat divided by change in temperature so the heat capacity is given that's 850 heat i want a heat i also know the heat which was given from the which was lost that is 8.4 expo 5 and the change in the temperature will be t minus 43 So bring the T minus forty three to this side. Take the eight fifty to the other side. So eight point four x four five divided by eight fifty plus that minus forty three will come to this side. It will add up plus forty three, and the final answer will be one zero three one. One thousand and thirty one degrees centigrade will be the final temperature of the. Uh, that was the initial temperature. Sorry, the one thousand thirty one degrees centigrade was the initial temperature of the horseshoe. So let's check the marking scheme. What the marking scheme has to say? It says one zero three one degree centigrade. So question number four, B, second part. You can have a look at that uh, marking scheme. Our answer is right. I hope that you have understood this question. So let's move to the next question, and that's question number question number five. The cable of a washing machine uh, contains three separate wires. There, there is a fuse in one of the wires. Uh, explain how the earth wire and the fuse works together to make the washing machine safer. So, uh, you see, if you have connected a earth wire with the casing of the washing machine, so if uh, God forbids, as uh, at some moment and during its working. if the live wire come in direct contact with the casing of the washing machine the casing will also become live but if you have connected a earth wire with the casing of the washing machine that live current through the earth wire because the earth wire has a very low resistance to the earth wire it will start going into the ground now the current is going through the earth wire to the ground and also the current is going to the machinery of the washing machine so the current coming from the main supply will increase when the current coming from the main supply will increase due to the surge of this current the fuse which you have connected in the live wire that will uh, become hot and it will melt once it will melt it will it will cut off the supply of the current to the washing machine and it will isolate the machine from the live current so the machine will become uh safe so let me check show you my answer i have written this answer also so okay so question number 5 a part is showing on you on your screen in case of washing machine in case if the washing machine comes in direct contact of the live wire current starts to go to the ground through the earth wire current coming from the main supply increases due to surge of the current the fuse melts and cut off the supply of the live current to the washing machine so this is my answer let's check what the marking scheme says marking scheme marking scheme okay so question number 5 is showing on your screen question number 5 a part if the live high voltage wire touches the casing machine or if the casing machine becomes live large current in the earth wire or resistance of the earth wire small fuse melts or disconnects the supply so these are the three points which we have to write and i think that we have written all the three points so let's move to the next part that's question number 5 and it's b part he says that uh, state the name of the wire in which the fuse is connected remember the fuse the switch that they are always connected in the live wire and then the next question is plain why the fuse is connected in this wire the fuse is always and the switch is also always connected in the live wire so whenever the fuse will blow or whenever you will open the switch so um, um what will happen your machine will be disconnected from the high voltage live current your machine will be isolated from the current so it will become safe to touch to maintain it to open it to deal with it so that's the b first part and the second part let me show you my answers and i have written these answers and uh, see what i have written so this is b part question number 5 b part fuse is always connected in the live wire and question number 5 b second part when fuse uh, increase the size 
So you uh, fuse is always connected in the live wire. Second part is when the fuse blows, it will isolate the washing machine from the high voltage live current. So let's check the marking scheme. What the marking scheme has to say about this and the live wire and the, when the fuse melts, the live wire is not connected to any part of the device. Is isolated is isolated from the main supply. So. Uh, So let me do the next one. He says the cable of a, the C part, first portion, as cable of a hair dryer contains only two, the name of each of these wires. So in the, in, in the hair dryer, you will have the, you will have the live wire and you will have the neutral wire only. And the next question, which is the last part of the question number five, uh, question number five, that is suggest why the hair dryer does not does not need an earth wire. The hair dryer does not need hair dry, uh, uh, earth wire. The reason is because you know uh, the casing of the hair dryer is made up of plastic. So plastic is an insulator of electricity. So you see, because the body is made up of the plastic, so the it, this is called double insulation. And when there is double insulation because the body of the plastic is, uh, uh, the body of the hair dryer is made up of the plastic. So there's no chances that the live current will come in the body of the, or the casing of the hair dryer. So there is no need of the earth wire. So let me show you my answer. I have written this answer as well. And let's see. Uh, yeah, here we have, uh, so question number uh, five C part, he says, uh, uh, live wire and the neutral wire and see second part casing of air dryer is made of plastic it is called double insulation this this methodology is called double insulation where the the body of the machine is made of plastic there is no chance of casing becoming live because the plastic is an insulator of the electricity so let me show you marking scheme and question number five the last part, live and neutral, double insulation or it's casing hair dryer is a plastic. Double insulation, this process is called, this safety measure is called uh, double insulation in which the body of the machine is made of the plastic. So let's move to the next part. That's the next question, actually. The next question is question number six. And it says, uh, uh, phosphorus uh, 1532 is an isotope of phosphorus that undergoes radioactive decay. The, mo mo the most common isotope of phosphorus is phosphorus 31. Describe the structure and the composition of the neutral atom of the phosphorus 31. So uh, remember, there is a trick to the, the phosphorus shown here. That's it's 1532. But the question is about the phosphorus 1531. So the examiner is trying to confuse you. Here, the atom which is shown, that's phosphorus 1532. The question is on phosphorus 1531. It's a two mark question. So let me show you. Uh, so here we go. Question number six, part A. Uh, here, he's talking about the phosphorus 1531. It has 15 protons and 16 neutrons in the nucleus and 15 electrons are orbiting the nucleus. So that's the atom of the phosphorus 1531. Let me check the marking scheme. What the marking scheme has to say. The marking scheme says that, uh, yeah, here on the screen, you can see the marking scheme. It says uh, 16 protons in the nucleus and 16 electrons in the shells or 16 protons in the nucleus. Uh, 16 electrons around the outside the surrounding orbiting the nucleus and 15 neutrons in the nucleus. Let me check my answer. I think so. I think I have made a mistake here. I wrote here phosphorus 15. And let me check. Let me check. Let me check that. So uh, I am back. I have to stop the recording because there is was a, there was an issue that phosphorus fifteen thirty one, 
uh, it has clearly um, 15 protons and there will be 16 neutrons and there will be 15 electrons orbiting in the nucleus. But the marking scheme, I, I don't know why this is happening, but the marking scheme has, I think, some mistake. Maybe I am on mistake, but I have rechecked it again and again. It says that there will be 16 protons in the nucleus and 16 electrons in the shells. That's a typing mistake. I think I think it's a typing mistake. Maybe I, I am wrong, but I believe that I am right. So um, don't go after these numbers. These numbers are wrong in the question number A, 6A first part. So uh, we are moving to the next question. The next part is state how. The next part is state how an atom of phosphorus 32 differs from an atom of phosphorus 31. So because they are isotopes of each other, you know, they are isotope of each other. And in the isotopes, you know, uh, the only difference between them is the number of neutrons in their nucleus. So phosphorus 1532 has 17 neutrons in its nucleus. While the phosphorus 1531 has 15 neutrons in its nucleus. So I hope that you have understood this. And let's, uh, let's start the next one. And let's check first of all the marking scheme. The marking scheme says, uh, what the marking scheme says about this. The marking scheme is one more neutron and the same number of protons in the nucleus or 15 neutrons in the phosphorus 31. And there will be 50, 16 in the phosphorus 32. So, I don't know, still it's, it's number of neutrons are different. Okay, so let's move to the next part. He says, uh, State how an atom of phosphorus 34 differs from an atom of the phosphorus 31. Okay. The next question is phosphorus 32 decays by beta particle emission of a stable isotope of sulfur. The half life for the this decay is two weeks. State how a nucleus of this isotope of sulfur is different to a nucleus of phosphorus 32. So now he's talking about sulfur. Uh, you see the phosphorus has gone under under a radioactive decay. A beta particle emission has taken place. We call it beta decay. And a daughter nucleus is formed that is, uh, that is sulfur. So let me show you. I've done written this answer and try, I will try to explain this also. Because, uh, you know, here, here, here you can see question number 6B, first part. And a phosphorus, 1532, went uh, under a beta decay. So the daughter nucleus formed will be sulfur 1632. Whenever a beta particle is given out, the proton number increases by one and the mass number do not change. So the sulfur has 16 protons and 16 neutrons in its nucleus and fast sulf uh, and uh, whereas the phosphorus has 15 protons and 16 neutrons in its nucleus. So, so our answer is perfect and let me check the marking scheme because the marking scheme has little problem. Okay, so one more proton and one and neutron fewer and that is his answer. Okay, so let's move to the next question. Our answers are right, uh, don't have to worry about them. Okay, so here we have uh, the next question. At time t equals to zero, a radioactive sample contains 3.2 x to 11 atoms of phosphorus 32. At the same moment, the sample contains no atoms of sulfur. This is how, this is shown by the cross on the figure 6.1. On the figure 6.1, plot a graph to show how the total number of sulfur atoms in the sample changes with the time t and draw a suitable curve. You see, this question is a little higher level question because Normally, when the question on the on the half life comes, you always draw the graph uh, for the for the uh, for the parent nucleus, and that is a curve, and it comes down with the passage of time. And here you have to draw a curve for the daughter nucleus, which is being produced. So when 
this decay started, there was no daughter nucleus. So at the zero time, that was zero. The half-life is two weeks. And the, the, at the start, the uh, parent nucleus are 3.2 X411. So I have to draw this. Let me show you how I have done this work. It's a little tricky question and because the graph is not about the parent nucleus. It is about the daughter nucleus being produced. So uh, let's move to the next question. Okay, so here we have, here I have, sh I have shown you a little table and this table is when the time is zero, the parent nucleus, which is phosphorus, uh, it's 9, 3.2 X for 11 uh, uh, atoms are present. At this moment, the, the sulfur is not there. Sulfur is the daughter nucleus, it's the product of that, that decay. So there is no sulfur present. So when two weeks will pass, the phosphorus left, half of it will have decayed. So how much phosphorus is left? That is 1.6 X for 11. So the phosphorus, half of the phosphorus which has decayed is actually has converted into the sulfur. So after two weeks, the amount of the sulfur present will be 1.6 X for 11. Then another two weeks passed by, four weeks have totally passed. So the amount of phosphorus left will be uh, 0.8 X411. So how much sulfur will be present at that, at that moment? So the sulfur, uh, the phosphorus 0.8 into 10 to the 11 has, has decayed now. So I will add this into 1.6 X411. So the sulfur present will be 2.4 X411. Now, another two weeks will pass by. The total time passed by is six weeks. So the phosphorus will be left. How much phosphorus will be left? That will be 0 0.4 into 10 to the 11. So how much sulfur will be present? That will be 2.4 X per 11 plus 0 0.4 X per 11. So if the sulfur will be 2.8 X per 11. Then another two weeks will pass by. The total time passed by will be eight weeks. The sulfur, uh, the phosphorus left will be 0 0.2 X per 11. And how much will be the sulfur present at that moment? 2.8 X per 11 plus 0 0.2 X per 11, and that will be 3 X per 11. So then I will plot this graph on, on, that, on that curve. You can see here, I have drawn this with the cursor. So my graph is not that smooth, but because you are working on the hard copy with a pencil, so your curve should be very, very a better curve. So you see at zero, the, at the zero, the sulfur present was zero. And when the two weeks have and the, when the two weeks have passed by, the amount of the sulfur will be 1.6 X411. And when four weeks have passed by, the amount of sulfur will be 2.4 X411. And when the six weeks have passed, the amount of sulfur is 2.8 X411. And when the eight weeks have passed, the amount of sulfur will be 3 X411. So I plotted these points and then I have joined them uh, with a smooth curve. And you can see that curve on the screen. Hopefully you will be able to do this on your paper. And remember that when the normal question comes on the half-life and you have to draw the graph. In the normal question, the graph is about the number of atoms present of the parent nucleus. But this question goes on a one step uh, higher in the difficulty level. And here you have to draw the, the, the number of atoms of the daughter nucleus. So its difficulty level is little higher. So hopefully you have understood my point. So let's move to the next question. And let's check the marking scheme, what the marking scheme has to say about this. So question number six, uh, B second part, he says points at the line to 2.0, 2.0, 1.6 X per lemon. Point at eight will be uh, eight will be 3.0 X per 11 or any other obvious correct points. Curve of positive and decreasing gradient at two, they are plotted points to at least six weeks. Okay, so hopefully the, our answer is perfect. So let's move to the next part, very easy part, and uh, it's coming on your screen. He says, uh, uh, yeah, it's a two mark question, question number six C part, he says, State two precautions taken when storing or moving radioactive materials. Whenever you are storing or moving the radioactive material, 
the one precaution, there are several precautions which you can take. Here you only have to write two. For example, you are supposed to wear the wear aprons which have lead lining in them. You have to wear the gloves which have lead lining in them. You have to make sure to minimize the time of exposure of your uh, students or, lay, or, or your teachers to the radioactive isotope. And another thing you can, if you are handling, you can use the tongs and you can pick and drop and uh, if you want to change the place of the radioactive material, use the tongs. Always store the radioactive material in a lead box. So there are so many precautions which you can write here. You only have to write two one, uh, two precautions. I have written two precautions. You just uh, uh, you can have a look at them. And so the minimum time, minimum minimum time of exposure, the time of exposure to the radioactive material should be minimum. And the second is wear aprons of the lead lining. So this is my answer. Let me show you the marking scheme here. Question number six C part. You can see. He has given a list of uh, precautions which you should use when you are working with the radioactive isotopes. You only have to pick two out of, out of this list and write them. Very simple and straightforward question. Okay, so uh, let's go back to the paper. Now, the section B will start. So uh, my dear students, uh, today we have done uh, October, November, 2020 and uh, this in this session we have only done the you know uh, the section a of this paper the section b of this paper i will do i will make a video and i will upload in the youtube channel on you, my youtube channel and you can find that in my youtube channel so um thank you very much this paper was from the zone 2 i hope that this will be helpful to you if this is helpful to you don't forget to subscribe to my youtube channel also suggest these videos to your friends and don't forget to uh, hit the like buttons and also don't hesitate to comment so thank you very much everybody it was a good uh, uh, good session so thank you very much have a good day. God bless you all.